So thank you everyone so much for joining us today for our ninth webinar in the Freshwater Stewardship Community webinar series. We're very excited to have Marianne here today to talk a bit about the importance of plant life to dragonflies and damselflies. If this is your first time attending a webinar in our series, I'll just give you a brief outline of what we're going to cover today. So we'll do some introductions of Marianne and myself, and she will present. Like I said, there will be a designated question and answer period at the end, and we'll also talk about some resources that will become available after this presentation. So the two people with you today are uh, Dr. Marianne Perron and myself. So if you have any kind of technical problems, you have any questions about Watersheds Canada, you can always direct them to me, either in a private message through Zoom, or you can send me an email. And I am uh, the Communications and Fundraising Coordinator at Watersheds Canada. And of course, during the Q&A, if you have specific questions about what you hear during the presentation, you can direct those to Dr. Perron. And that can happen through just a general Q&A or through a specific email to her after the webinar. So about the freshwater stewardship community, uh, we launched at the beginning of this year and it already has over 900 members across Canada and different countries, which has been a really wonderful way for us to connect with everyone during different restrictions and uh, closures. We've still been able to stay connected and bring you different resources and webinars throughout the year. So this is our ninth webinar. And most of the webinars also have accompanying handouts and education resources, which are on our website. It's watersheds.ca slash freshwater hyphen stewardship. And we would just like to thank the S.M. Blair Family Foundation for funding the Freshwater Stewardship Community. If you are unfamiliar with Watersheds Canada, we are a national nonprofit and charitable organization based in Perth, Ontario, which is about an hour from Ottawa. Our focus is really working with individuals and community group members to protect their fresh water. So this is their lakes, rivers, shorelines, and all of the different wildlife habitat around those areas. Uh, the one program that I did want to specifically mention today as it ties in with the topic for the presentation is our Natural Edge program. So this is our shoreline renaturalization program. It has just launched across Canada, so we are officially in four provinces, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and New Brunswick. So I would encourage you if you are in one of those provinces and wondering if you can participate in the program and naturalize your shoreline using native plant species to visit our website, which is naturaledge.watersheds.ca. So at this time, I'm just going to introduce uh, Dr. Marianne Perron. So she is a freshwater biologist with expertise in wetland ecosystem and urban ecology. She grew up in a small town in Northern Ontario where she spends her free time outdoors, usually on the water. She has a BSc Honours in Biology with a specialization in Conservation and Restoration Ecology from Laurentian University, and then completed her PhD in Biology, specializing in wetland ecosystems, entomology, and urban ecology from the University of Ottawa. She has experience teaching in the classroom and in the field, as well as running workshops for youth organizations. She is a certified wetland evaluator with skills in wetland plant identification, biostatistics, and spatial analyses, and she is currently involved in leading citizen science programs and collaborates in international efforts in insect conservation. So I'll invite you to share your screen now. Okay. Let me know if you could see it. Thank you for the introduction, Monica. It looks good on my end. Yeah, okay. I don't have the best internet, so I apologize for that in advance. I'm gonna try to keep my camera on, but please, if I start getting really choppy, let me know and I'll turn it off so I could finish my presentation. But uh, thank you to Watersheds Canada for having me here today. My name is Marianne Perron. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Ottawa in collaboration with uh, the St. Lawrence River Institute. And today I'm going to talk to you about the importance of wetland plants for dragonflies and damselflies. So 
So plants and animals have evolved together for millions of years, and as a result, the knowledge and understanding of plant-animal interactions has been a key element in biodiversity studies. In particular, plant-insect interactions is one of the most dominant biotic interactions that we see today. Most of the attention, however, has been in, the, in this domain has been attributed to mutualistic interactions, such as this monarch butterfly, uh, drinking the nectar from this milkweed, but also pollinating the milkweed. So mutualistic interactions means that both parties benefit from this interaction. Or they have been focused on antagonistic interactions. So antagonistic interactions is when one party benefits at the, at the expense of the other party. So this is an example of an antagonistic interaction. I took this photo in Alberta and all these red, these red trees here, those are dead spruce due to the spruce budworm. So the spruce budworm is going to extract the resources from the tree, uh, damaging or even killing the tree in, uh, in consequence. But what about everyday interactions that are not mutualism or antagonism driven? These interactions are undoubtedly important and contribute to the great richness of species that we see on Earth today. One group of species that have been around for a very long time are Odonata. So Odonata are dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, their ancestors, the Proto-Odonata, have been around since the Carboniferous, Carboniferous period, 325 million years ago. Uh, there are a lot of similarities between the ancestors of Odonata and the modern day Odonata that we see today, although the ancestors of Odonata were much larger. So they had, uh, for example, Meganura had a wingspan of 75 centimeters. So they were giant dragonflies back in the day, and they have evolved to the dragonflies that we see today. Although they're much smaller today, they still have a lot of the same uh, characteristics and traits that they did uh, back in the day. So just to give you a perspective of how ancient these insects really are, Proto-Odonata evolved 100 million years before dinosaurs did. So they've had a very long time to adapt to their environment. Uh, this is a fossil from 155 million years ago, so you could see the similarities between uh, Odonata throughout history and what we see today. Uh, as modern Odonata. So Odonata today are majorly divided into two suborders. So the Zygoptera, which are the damselflies on this side of the presentation here, or Anisoptera, which are dragonflies. So the main visual distinction between the two suborders is that damselflies are usually more delicate and they hold their wings um, behind their back when they're perching, whereas dragonflies usually have a broader body and they hold their wings horizontal when they're perching. So both these uh, suborders of Odonata have a biphasic life cycle, which means that they spend part of their life cycle in the aquatic environment and part of the life, their life cycle in the terrestrial environments. So the adults here are terrestrial, whereas the nymphs are aquatic. There's approximately 5,900 described species of Odonata worldwide today. And as I mentioned, because they're such ancient insects, they have this really intrinsic connection to the environment. So they're very closely tied to their environment. And as a result of those close ties and other features of uh, Odonata, they're used quite often as biological indicators. For those of you who don't know what a biological indicator is, uh, this is just a snippet that describes it well from a paper by Foot and Rice published in 2005. So they say that a biological indicator is a taxon, guild, or community selected on the basis of its sensitivity to a particular environmental attribute, thus having the ability to reflect environmental. So I have the ability to integrate information on habitat quality. Odonata are great biological indicators uh, because they are well studied taxonomically. They're quite easy to identify as adults anyway. They're super widespread and abundant, so they're found in nearly all freshwater habitats. Uh, they're found in a range of environmental conditions, so there's some, just to give you an example, there's some Odonata species that are found in sewer lagoons, but there's other Odonata species that are only found in pristine bog habitats, for example. So they have this huge range 
of environmental conditions based on what species. Uh, they respond readily to environmental change, so they're active dispersers, um, and their species assemblages are large enough for ecological assessment. So just to give you an example, I'm in the Ottawa region right now, and we have about 123 species of Odonata here. The main reason why I chose them for my research is because they require this land-water interface. So because they spend part of their life cycle in the water and then emerge and spend the rest of their life cycle in the terrestrial environment, they can reflect both the aquatic and the terrestrial aspects of a habitat. This is a painting by Brown in 1893 and I love to show this painting because it shows basically all the different parts of the Odonata life cycle. So we have the nymphs down here swimming in the water, we have the nymphs from their exuviae, we then have uh, the adults up here flying around looking for a mate and then reproducing and laying their eggs. So we see all different parts of the Odonata life cycle in this painting. And what else do we see? Well, we see a lot of plants. So Odonata have this very tight link to the plants in their environment. And there's been a lot of research on this and what we know so far about their interaction with plants. I'm going to describe those in the next few slides. So the most direct link that Odonata have to plants is with uh, endophytic ovipositors. So all damselflies, so that whole suborder of Zygoptera, they're all endophytic ovipositors as well as one family of dragonflies, the darners, so these big blue and black ones, they are also endophytic ovipositors. And what that means is that these uh, groups lay their eggs directly inside of plant tissues. So this is a photo I took of an ebony jawing, and you can see the tip of her abdomen here in the water, uh, get pressed against the stem of a plant. She's actually slicing a small slit in the plant stem and depositing her eggs in that plant stem. And this protects the eggs from desiccation and predation. And this is one of the ancient structures, actually, that these groups of Odonata have retained from their ancient ancestors. So this is a figure uh, published by Petroviscus et al. And these are basic fossil records of Odonata. This ovipositor that damselflies have, as well as the darners, is an ancient structure that they've kept from their ancestors. Other more indirect interactions that Odonata have with plants are emergent substrates. So almost all species of Odonata, apart from a few exceptions, need a vertical substrate to emerge from their nymphal life stage into their adult life stage. This is a photo of a dragon hunter that I took. And as you could see, he crawled up vegetation. You could see his legs clasping onto the plant stems. And you push himself out of his, his exuviae and emerge from. So all these dragonflies need these emergent plants and these substrates and structures to emerge into their adult life stage. Other aspects um, of Odonata plant interactions would be the use of plants as perches for shelter and for thermoregulation. This is a photo here of an Eastern amber wing, and you can see him perched on a plant. He's in the obelisk position, which is a position that dragonflies do when they need to reduce their thermal, their temper basically their body temperatures. So they're gonna reduce the surface area of their body that's exposed to the sun. They're going to put their, the tip of their abdomen towards the sun, uh, which will cool the body down. But they need these perches to do so. Other uh, interactions between Odonata and plants and their environment has to do with predator-prey relationships, creating habitat complexity and habitat structure for Odonata. There's been many studies on nymphs and aquatic plants. So when there's aquatic plants present in an environment, actually reduces the amount of uh, predation on Odonata nymphs. So when you have more plants present, it increases habitat complexity and you get better survival of Odonata nymphs. 
So we know that odonata are linked to plants, but how can this translate into our man-made features and these constructed aquatic water bodies that we're creating around cities. So my research sort of focuses on how can we improve man-made features to support Odonata populations. And my study systems are stormwater management ponds. So for those of you who aren't familiar with stormwater management ponds, they're constructed engineered pond systems created in cities and are used to collect stormwater runoff. So because cities have so much pavement, water does not permeate through that pavement. So it basically just sits on the surface and it increases the risk and severity of flooding in cities. So it's actually mandatory in Ontario now to construct these stormwater management ponds to collect all of this runoff to prevent flooding in cities and also uh, to improve the quality of surface water. So these ponds have the ability to settle out certain contaminants. So these systems are completely managed um, we, we manage these systems, so especially they're, you know, they have extreme water quality impairments at some of them. Uh, my research sort of focuses on some of that water quality stuff, but a lot of my research focuses on the plant communities present in these ponds. So the two objectives that I'm going to go through today uh, in this presentation for my study is, well, are stormwater ponds a good habitat for Odonata? Um, we're going to first look at the differences in adult Odonata biodiversity between stormwater ponds and natural wetlands. So natural reference systems in the area, basically what we, the baseline conditions for biodiversity in these natural ecosystems, we're going to try to compare them against these constructed ecosystems to see how they, how they support biodiversity. The second objective is to assess whether Odonata are influenced by plant communities at these stormwater ponds. So what I did, I studied 41 stormwater ponds across Ottawa, Ontario. So they are represented by these black circles here. And then I also uh, sampled 10 natural wetlands across the region as well, just to get these baseline reference conditions of plant communities and Odonata communities as well. I sampled, uh, did surveys for adult Odonata throughout the summer. And I also did plant surveys. I'm not going to get super into the methodology, but if you are interested, feel free to ask questions at the end. Uh, but basically identified all the adult dragonflies and damselflies at each pond and went back and identified all the plants at the ponds as well. So the first objective, what were the differences in adult Odonata biodiversity between stormwater ponds and natural ponds? So this graph here, basically, I'll walk you through uh, the graphs that I've added in this presentation, but on the x-axis here, we have urban pond age. So because they are stormwater ponds, they are constructed, we actually know how old each pond is. So if you see the five down here, that means that that pond was constructed five years ago, 10 means it was constructed 10 years ago, and so forth. On this axis here, we have the number of species of Odonata per pond. So if you look at one of these points here, this point here means that in a pond that's two years old, we have 13 different Odonata species. And when we try to see if there's a relationship between the number of Odonata species and the age of the ponds, you can see that there is no clear relationship. So a pond that's two years old, has the same number of Odonata species as a pond that's 36 years old, for example. So Odonata are very quick to colonize these systems. We do have some, a lot of variation here though. You see that there's some ponds that have only four species of Odonata, while there's others that have over 20 species of Odonata. So what is driving that variation? These are box plots here. So stormwater ponds are in gray and natural uh, wetlands are in green here. Dragonfly species richness is on uh, the y-axis and damselfly species richness is in this plot. So species richness just means the number of species. So this plot on your left is the number of dragonfly species per pond on average. 
basically the average is this dark black line here. And the sides of these plots is the variation. So between all of the stormwater ponds and all the natural ponds. So if we look at dragonfly species richness here, we see that on average, there are less dragonfly species in the stormwater ponds than there are in the natural ponds but there's a big variation. So there's still some ponds that, are, that have two species of dragonflies while others have 12 species of dragonflies, for example. So we have a big variation, but on average, we have less dragonfly species in the stormwater ponds compared to the natural ponds. And we see an opposing trend for damselflies. So we actually see more species, slightly more species of damselflies in the stormwater ponds compared to the natural ponds. When we look at abundance, so abundance, it's basically just a number, an estimation of the number of dragonflies found per pond. So dragonflies, again, is on your left here, and damselflies is on your right. And you can see here that on average, natural ponds have about over four times more dragonflies than stormwater ponds do. There is some variation in that, where, you know, the best stormwater ponds having some of, you know, similar abundances of dragonflies to you know, the lower uh, natural ponds, but on average, we have a lot less dragonflies in the stormwater ponds compared to the natural ponds, whereas damselflies uh, abundance doesn't really differ significantly. So we actually have the same number of damselflies in the stormwater ponds compared to the natural ponds. So that sort of answers our first objective is that there are differences between these man-made systems compared to the natural systems in the region. Uh, but there is variation within these man-made systems with some having poor, you know, biodiversity and others having better biodiversity and, and comparable biodiversity to the natural ponds. So the next step is to determine why. Why is there a difference between, you know, good and bad stormwater ponds? And does plant communities have anything to do with this? So when we looked at the plant communities present in these two systems, so stormwater ponds is on your left here, on your right, what we found was that stormwater ponds have more plant species compared to natural ponds. So we have more different species on average in the stormwater ponds compared to the natural ponds. Some people might think, wow, that's a good thing, but I'm going to get into that in the next couple of slides. When we look closer at these plant communities, we see that natural ponds have more wetland plants. So if we look at the stormwater pond community, we have a few wetland plants. So these are plants that need to live in hydric soils or waterlogged soils, basically plants that need wet soils to live. And when we look at the natural ponds, we actually have the majority of the community is wetland plants compared to stormwater ponds where we have about half of the community that's wetland plants. So the reason why we have so many more species at, of plants at the stormwater ponds compared to the natural ponds, and they're not, it's not necessarily more wetland plant species, but it's because we have all these non-native plants found in the stormwater ponds. So 80 to 90% of the plant species in the natural ponds were native species. So species that are found naturally occurring in the area, whereas about half of the plants at the stormwater ponds are actually non-native species, so plants that are exotic. And because they're in urban centers, you could probably imagine that there's a, a larger chance for these plants to establish in these systems, especially because they are disturbed systems. So we have a lot more non-native plants in the stormwater ponds that contributes to higher species richness of plants in the stormwater ponds, but the natural ponds still have more wetland species. Some of the problematic invasive plant species that I saw at the stormwater ponds were European frogwet here. Uh, this plant actually was found in a lot of the natural wetlands as well, so it must have a very good dispersal ability. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with this one, purple blue strife. So purple blue strife is found in almost every single stormwater pond. And another problematic one was this flowering brush here. So I just put this slide in for you guys to sort of recognize these bad invaders. Um, so if you see if you see them, you know that they're they're non-native invasive species. So this is similar. Uh, graph to the one with the urban pond age. 
But this graph is telling us that stormwater ponds with a higher richness of native plants supports higher abundances of dragonflies. So we have native plant species richness on the x-axis. So basically, as the axis goes from left to right, we have more native species on the right. So we have, you know, 10 native plant species um, at the start of this, this axis, and it goes up to 50 native plant species. On our y-axis here, we have dragonfly abundance. So basically, when we go from lower to higher, we're getting um, more dragonfly abundance as we go higher. So I plotted the natural ponds here just to show you where they fall in this plot, but the stormwater ponds are plotted in black. So basically, we have a relationship, a significant relationship with the number of native plant species and the number of dragonflies at a pond. So when we get more native plants, we're actually getting more dragonflies. And this relationship is very strong when we look at dragonfly abundance and damselfly abundance with the number of obligate wetland plant species. So again, an obligate wetland plant is a plant that has a 99% chance of being found in waterlogged soil. So it's basically a plant that needs a wet environment to live. If you look at the lowest amount of obligate wetland plant species to the highest amount of wetland plant species, so we start with five plant, uh, wetland plant species and we go up all the way to 35. And on the y-axis here, we have dragonfly abundance. So we have the dragonfly graph on your left and the damselfly graph on your right. The natural ponds are plotted in green here just to show you where they fall in these plots. But the stormwater ponds are in black, and that's what I want you guys to focus on. So basically, what these two plots are doing is that when you have ponds have high numbers of wetland plants, you're gonna have higher numbers of dragonflies and damselflies. So plants or ponds that have a lot of wetland plants are supporting larger population sizes of dragonflies and damselflies. These are some of the plants, the native wetland plants that were important in the study. There's a few of them, so if you want a full list, you could go uh, see this paper in Biodiversity and Conservation. But basically, it seems like dragonflies and damselflies love these spike rushes. Uh, they like uh, arrowheads, boa rushes, alders, swamp candles, uh, duckweeds, uh, just to give you a few examples. So this sort of an answers our second objective. So part of the variation between biodiversity within the stormwater ponds and between the stormwater ponds has to do with plants. So those relationships that I showed you were with adult dragonflies and damselflies. I did do a lot of study on the So what about the other life stages? This is a nymph here. When I looked at the influence of plants um, in comparison to water quality and landscape features on the nymphs of dragonflies, so dragonflies again on your left here, and damselfly nymphs on your right, plants are always the most important feature. So basically the size of these circles here represents the amount of variation that these features explain on community structure of both dragonfly nymphs and damselfly nymphs. So plants are very important to dragonfly nymphs. Uh, water quality was also important to dragonfly nymphs and what really came out in this study was that road salts were actually uh, affecting the community structure or there was a relationship with basically if you when you had ponds that had a lot of salt in them you had less dragonflies as well but plants did play a very large role in the community structure of dragonfly nymphs in these ponds and again realize these ecosystems are constructed man-made systems so they do experience some of these extremes they get have a lot of invasive species they're surrounded by a lot of urban and modified land cover and they generally have poor water quality because they receive all of this urban runoff. When we look at damselflies, land cover had no effect on the community structure that was significant. Water had a small effect but plant, plants really explained 
the largest variation in uh, damselfly community structure at the nymph stage. And if you think back to the beginning of this presentation, damselflies, all damselflies, are obligate endophytes. So they need these plants to lay their eggs in, whereas only one family of dragonflies lays their eggs in plants. So it does make sense, you know, that uh, damselflies are so closely related to the plant communities at these ponds. So in conclusion, plant odonata interactions may be important in urban ecosystems. And when I say may be important, uh, this research is largely observational and descriptive. So correlation does not you know, equal causation, but there are biological reasons why there would be a direct and plant odor not an interaction uh, between these two environments. But basically what I can tell you is that when you have a shoreline that has a lot of wetland plants, you're gonna have a lot of dragonflies and damselflies, whether that be a direct impact or an indirect impact. Odonata abundances are higher at ponds with a diversity of native wetland plants, so the quality of these shoreline plant communities really do matter to Odonata. These are two pictures here of stormwater ponds. You can see there's a big variation in what these ponds look like. And these are designed and engineered systems, so you know certain uh, engineering firms are going to construct them in different ways. And just to zoom in on a closer look, this is not a good pond for dragonflies. It has no littoral zone. It has these rock walls. Therefore, there's literally no wetland plants in this pond. So this pond is not going to have a lot of dragonflies and damselflies. And I could tell you that this probably goes for a lot of other uh, animals and other insects that depend on this wetland habitat. So this type of pond is not a good system for uh, dragonflies and damselflies. If you want to design a good pond for dragonflies and damselflies, it would be something that looks like this, with a gradual sloping bank, lots of opportunities for wetland plants to establish. This is a good stormwater pond here that's supporting a lot of odonata biodiversity. So the implications for this research, um, basically this research comes up with a lot of suggestions for pond design and management. So because these are designed ponds, if a biologist works with, you know, the engineering firms, they could probably do a better job at um, the designing these systems for biodiversity. Um, and if we enhance biodiversity, we're enhancing ecosystem function. And we're also enhancing the opportunity for people to connect with nature. So this is my beautiful niece here. And you can see this connection um, right now that a big darner landed on her sweater. And I think this connection with nature is more important now than ever. It's not only going to improve the well-being of humans, but this connection, you know, it makes people care about nature, love nature, and therefore they want to conserve and protect nature. I think often we forget that we are actually part of this ecosystem and these connections to nature and to species are really, really important. Uh, this research may also be applicable to other types of shorelines. There is a lot of research out there that shows that in stream ecosystems, macrophytes are important, for example. Uh, this summer, I'm actually conducting river research and trying to apply some of these concepts from this study to river ecosystems. But because dragonflies are specific to their habitat, so there's dragonfly species that live in wetlands, dragonflies that live in lakes, and other species that live in rivers, River species have different traits than wetland species, so we might see different results. Uh, this is just, this is a little bit off topic, but this summer I'm uh, sampling the Mississippi River by Ottawa here, so in Almont and Pakenham. And this is just something really cool that I saw in the field I, sh I thought I would show you if this video works. But basically, this is stream bluettes, so damselflies right here, and they're in tandem, so they're breeding, and the female is laying eggs in a plant stem, and they're actually submerged underwater. So the adults dove underwater, they're laying eggs in a plant stem, and I timed them, and they were under there for eight minutes. So you could see here, this is the water surface. They're right underwater, the adults. 
So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this before, but I just thought it was something very cool to see you. So uh, to show you. So you know, plants might also be important in the rivers, uh, pretty important in the rivers as well. So with that, um, I want to thank, you know, a lot of people who helped me with my research. The city of Ottawa collaborated with us and they were really a great help. All my funding agencies. The Ottawa Field Naturalists, for those of you who are here in Ottawa and are not part of this group now, they're really a great, great research group and they've been funding my research for like five or six years now. So I'm really appreciative of them. All these people, uh, my supervisor, Francis, um, Basically, all these people are some of the big contributors uh, to the research, as well as um, the University of Ottawa. And I made this presentation on River Institute time, so thank you to the River Institute as well. If you're interested in dragonfly pictures and pictures of other animals and stuff, this is my Instagram account. You could go and follow it. This is just a self plug, but I have a, a workshop coming up next week, so next Wednesday at six o'clock. Um, and it's basically a, an identification workshop. So if you send me your pictures at this email here, mapuron at riverinstitute.ca, um, or questions, if you, if you think of a question after this presentation is over, please email it to me and uh, I could answer or identify your photos live uh, next week and also give you tips on how to identify adult dragonflies. Thank you, and if you guys have any questions about dragonflies, feel free to ask away if you have some time left. Perfect, so I just popped in your email and Instagram account if people want to see all of your field adventures. Uh, it's always nice to see Thank the different you. things that you find. And I've also dropped in our evaluation survey. If people have a few minutes before they log off and they can just let us know what they thought of the webinar, if it covered what you expected, um, that would be very helpful for us to report back to our funders. And so now we will go into the Q&A session. There is one in the chat from Rosalie, and she's wondering, um, areas used to seed them kind of into the wetlands. So she's wondering if it's still a practice that you know of. So when you say seed, what do you mean? To uh, Rosalie? Oh, introduced by air. Yeah, so I've heard a lot of people tell me that. Um, I don't know of any programs that actually introduce the dragonflies nowadays. Uh, so I think the best we could do is, you know, provide these natural shorelines. Like, don't mow to the bank. Leave that natural buffer, and it's not only going to help your dragonfly communities, it's going to help a load of other species as well. And we love dragonflies because they're beautiful, colorful, but they also eat so many mosquitoes. They, you know, provide that service to us. So I think it's important for us to, to uh, try to see them, you know, try to create good habitats for them ourselves if you're a shoreline owner. Okay, I, I see another one here by Danielle. Is Odin a popular naturalist outdoor activity in Canada? Are there any organizations or groups we should follow to get into odinatology? So it's definitely a, a activity that's gaining momentum. I think that in Canada, there are a lot of uh, people who go Odin. I think it's maybe a little bit more common in the States, but there's a lot of people here in Canada that are interested in Odin and a lot of birders are actually, you know, once they're done birding in the morning, they'll shift to dragonflies. I think it's uh, something that it's it's really fun and it's honestly not that hard to uh, learn the adults. The way I learned um, for the area, there's a really great field guide for you know Ottawa and anywhere around central Ontario, and even you know lots of species are in that field guide from southern Ontario as well. It's the guide from Colin Jones. It's the dragonflies and damselflies of Algonquin Park. I could send you that resource in the chat or or something in a bit, but Basically, the organizations and groups that you should follow if you really are interested. Uh, there's Dragonfly Societies of America. There's this amazing app called Odinata Central. 
where you, it's like iNaturalist, but just for dragonflies. So you could report your, your sightings on that app. There's also really good Facebook groups. So if you take a picture of a dragonfly and you don't know what it is, if you post it to a group called Northeast Odonata, so that's for our area, but there's groups, Facebook groups all over, you know, all over the world, and they'll help you identify it as well. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> is there any other questions or comments? I'm just looking at the chat box here. Thank you, Arlie. Okay, well, if that's it, I did put uh, Marianne's email in the chat and we'll also send out an email at the end of this week with the webinar recording as well as a one-page handout with some of the different links that were mentioned in the presentation today and also if you want to contact Marianne directly to read her research um, you can do that as well and I think uh, that's about it if anyone has any other questions oh one from Olivia here um, so she's saying that you mentioned there was a document outlining all of the plant species that you recommend for planting. Where would that be? So that's in my, it's in like the scientific journal. So I can send you that paper. So there's like a nice table in it that, that has all uh, the plant species. I could send that to you. If you send me an email or put your email in the chat, I could send you that paper. So you have it and you could check out, you know, that this is just a snippet of of some of the stuff I found. So there's a lot more information in that paper too, if you're interested. So yeah, just send me an email or post your email and I'll send you, I'll send you the paper. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna copy this. Thank you guys so much for coming. And uh, if you are interested or have, you know, some dragonfly photos in your, in your camera roll, please send them to me and I could help you um, identify them next week in the workshop. And Pat's wondering if you can send it to her too. I'll uh, connect the two of you as well. So yes, Perfect. thank you very much, Marianne. And we will uh, send everything to people this week and hope that you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you guys.